Okay, a transistor has three states. It has off, on, and saturated. Let's look at using a transistor as a switch. As a switch, I want to use the transistor to turn the device fully on or fully off. I want to switch between those two states, on and off. The objective here is to do that. Typically, I use a transistor as a switch when I've got something fairly wimpy, like a microprocessor, trying to drive something which demands more power than the processor can output. Typically, a processor can output 5 volts and 20 milliamps. If I want to drive something like a 5-watt LED or a 3-horsepower motor, it's going to need more than 5 volts and possibly more than 20 milliamps. To do that, I need a buffer. Transistor is that buffer. Now note that if I can turn the device fully on and fully off, I can also do anywhere in between using pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation is where you vary the on-off time of a signal. On the oscilloscope there, you see a 0 volt, 5 volt signal driving a light. When the output is 5 volts, the light is on. When it's 0 volts, the light is off. By varying the on time, you can see that the light gets brighter. Likewise, if I can drive a device fully on, fully off, I can go anywhere in between using pulse width modulation. Another example of using a transistor as a switch is a strobe light. Here I've got a 5 watt LED being buffered to a processor with a transistor that we'll talk about a little bit later. The light is shining on a spinning motor. You can see the pulses on the oscilloscope. I'm varying the time between pulses. The result is it looks like the fan is going forward or going backwards. This is the reason that flashing lights are dangerous when you have rotating equipment. I might think that the fan is stationary and stick my finger in. Try to touch it. It's not stationary. So let's try to design a circuit to turn a device fully on, fully off. Let's start out with the 60 milliwatt LED. Suppose I've got a load, a 60 milliwatt LED in this case, that needs 3 volts to turn on and 20 milliamps. Come up with a circuit so that a microprocessor can turn that on and off. Well, in this case, if I need less than 5 volts, 20 milliamps or less, I don't need a transistor. I can connect it directly to the microprocessor using a resistor. To size the resistor, I can find the voltage drop across the resistor, 5 volts minus 3 volts. The current that I want is 20 milliamps. Tells you that R is 100 ohms. The resistor limits the current and allows me to turn the light on and off. That's what we saw in the previous video where the pulse width modulation was turning on and off the white LED. Now, suppose I want to drive a bigger load, something that needs more than 5 volts, more than 20 milliamps. That could be a heater, a motor, uh, something a little bit more interesting than just a small light. In that case, I need a transistor. The transistor needs to operate between two states, on and off. For off, the current should be zero. For on, in this case, the current should be one amp. Let's consider first the off case. In the off case, that's actually fairly easy to do. The transistor is controlled by the base current. The base current goes through a diode I need at least 0.7 volts across that diode. If I can make sure the current is zero, make sure that the input is less than 0.7 volts, there's no current in the base, meaning no current collector to emitter. The easy way to do that is apply zero volts at the input. Then the base emitter will have zero current and the transistor is off. The harder case is designing it for when the transistor is saturated. To saturate the transistor, I will replace the transistor with a saturation model. VCE is 0.2 volts. The current through here will be 10 volts minus 0.2 over 10 ohms, which is 9.98 amps, roughly 1 amp. If I apply 5 volts to turn it on, what I want to make sure it's saturated is that beta times IB is greater than IC max, greater than 1 amp. The 10 volt source can only push 1 amp through that 10 ohm resistor. Likewise, I know the maximum current I'll ever get through that transistor. 
If I can make beta IB bigger than that, I can guarantee I'm saturating when the input is 5 volts. I can then pick RB to set the current to make sure the transistor saturates. Now, to illustrate what's happening, a load line is oftentimes kind of useful. What the load line does is it shows the behavior of the transistor over here. Let's look at the 10-volt source, 10-ohm resistor. If the transistor was turned off, current would be zero. I'd be right here. If the transistor has no current through it, it has 10 volts across it. That's the off state. Next, consider the case where the transistor has zero volts across it. It won't actually ever get to zero. It would maybe get to 0.2 volts, but let's assume zero for now. If I have zero volts across that transistor, I've got the full 10 volts across the 10 ohm resistor. I've got one amp flowing. That circuit is a linear circuit. I've got a 10 volt source, 10 ohm resistor. The voltage and current will be a straight line. That's your load line. Any voltage current has to be somewhere in that line. The middle area is called the active region. That's where the transistor actually gets hot. The power is volts times amps. Over here, when I'm off, power equals zero. Current is zero, so power is zero. Over here, power equals zero. Voltage is zero, so volts times amps is zero. In the middle, the transistor is actually dissipating energy. It will get hot. Likewise, I want to avoid that. To make sure I saturate, what I'm going to do is pick beta times IB to be more than 1 amp, say 1.2 amps. So this is my design point for the on state. That'll be my safety margin to make sure that I saturate. So here's the design approach. I need to pick RB to make sure the transistor saturates. Let's pick a point, say 1.5 amps. For my design point when it's on, I want beta times IB to be 1.5 amps. Something bigger than 1. How much more is kind of your judgment? If I pick a transistor, say one with a beta of 400, I know that IB should be 3.8 milliamps. They're 1.5 amps divided by beta of 400. If I know IB, I know RB. I've got 4.3 volts across RB. I've got 3.8 milliamps through RB. I know what RB is. RB should be 1146 ohms. Now note that there's a little bit of room for slop. I picked beta times IB to be 1.5. It doesn't really matter if it's 1.4 or 1.6. It needs to be at least 1. So likewise, you don't really have to make RB exactly 1146 ohms. Make it something close say 1K, 1.2K, somewhere in there. By setting RB to 1K, I now have a switch. When the input is 0 volts, the transistor is off. When the input is 5 volts, the transistor is on. What works for a 10 ohm resistor also works for an LED. Suppose I've got a 10 watt LED. The LED draws 11 volts and has 900 milliamps when it's dropping 11 volts. Come up with a way to turn that LED on and off. Here, I'd use a switch. If I just had an on-off switch, I could put the switch between the LED and ground, limit the current with a 10-ohm resistor, and I'd have an LED that turns on and off. With a transistor, I can use the electronic switch, the transistor, to turn it on and off. I use a transistor instead of the switch. If I can set the base current to zero, I turn the switch off. One way to make the base current zero is apply zero volts at the input. If there are zero volts from base to emitter, this diode turns off, and the transistor guaranteed is turned off. To turn on the transistor, all I really need to note is what the on current is. When I saturate the transistor, I'm going to be pushing 900 milliamps through the transistor. That's IC max. 
since I'm pushing the same current through the transistor that I did before, before it was 1 amp, now it's 900 milliamps, I can use the same design as before. I want to pick beta times IB to be greater than IC max. I could just as easily say let, let beta IB be 1.5 amps. That's more than 900 milliamps. The same design will work. Let RB be 1.2 kilo ohms. That way when the input is 5 volts, I'm pushing enough current through to saturate that transistor. As an illustration, here is pulse width modulation driving a 10 watt LED. And if you notice, the 10 watt LED casts quite a bit of a shadow. It's rather blinding to look at. I can vary the brightness using pulse width modulation just like I did with the 60 milliwatt LED. One bit of warning. If you're using a transistor as a switch to turn on and off a motor, you need to be a little bit careful. The energy in a motor, motor is basically inductive. The energy in inductor is one half Li squared. As I produce current through the diode, the energy is stored in a magnetic field. When I set the current to zero using pulse width modulation, the energy gets released. The energy must go somewhere. The voltage across an inductor is LDIDT. When the current goes to zero, the derivative goes to infinity. Essentially what's happening is the field collapses, it, the energy will find a, a way to dissipate, the current will find a path to ground. In this case, your path to ground is your transistor, your transistor fries. That's how a spark plug works. You charge up a coil, set the current to zero, as the field collapses, it will find a path through ground. For your car, the path through ground is your spark plug. That keep, makes the car run. For this circuit, the path through ground is the transistor. You're going to fry your transistor. To prevent that, use a flyback diode. What happens is when the transistor turns on, I produce current through the motor. When the transistor turns off, inductors try to keep the current constant. It needs a path to go. It needs a way for the magnetic field to collapse and keep the current flowing. The path that it follows is through a diode, through your flyback diode. The diode turns on when the transistor turns off, saving your transistor. Essentially, the current has a choice. It can fry your transistor or go through the diode. The diode only needs 0.7 volts. Another way to look at that, the voltage drop across the diode is 0.7 volts. This is 20 volts. The diode clips this voltage. It clips it at 20.7 volts. If I ever get a voltage bigger than 20.7, the diode turns on, saving your transistor. This is an example where flyback diodes are used. Here I'm using pulse width modulation to drive a motor. As the pulse width gets bigger and bigger, the motor goes faster. Notice there's a big spike on the voltage. That spike is the inductor being turned off, the magnetic field collapsing, and the current finding a path to ground, producing a voltage of LBIDT. The flyback diode clips that voltage at your power supply plus 0.7, 20.7 volts, saving the transistor. So what we have now is a transistor operating as a switch. I can turn a device fully on, fully off. And given that, I can actually vary the speed anywhere between 0% and 100% using pulse width modulation.